All right. Hello. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, no, that's a proper answer. Thank you very much for joining me for this talk. Uh, I know it's lunchtime and you choose to sit in the room, listen to some stuff, so kudos to you. Um, the talk today is going to be about location transparency and out of curiosity. How many of you have heard the term before? No one? No networking people in the room, I guess. All right, yeah, it is a term that actually comes from networking. So if you ever done anything networking in the past, uh, you should ring a bell. And it's not what we will talk about today. Um, so you know how it typically goes, like speakers go on the first slide is about me and I'm supposed to tell you why I'm the smart guy here who's going to give you some smart things to learn today and you know, go through all the introduction, justify my presence on stage. I'm going to skip all that part. Um, but there is a story about me that I need to tell you in order to understand the further topics we'll discuss in this talk. Um, and, okay, okay, I should say my name, all of you have seen it, Milan Yankov, I work for Exonic. Uh, and this is where I live. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice house, not far from the city center. My kids certainly love it, and they love it for two reasons. They have easy communication to school and pubs and, you know, all the fun stuff that they need to do. And also, it's easy to invite friends, right? So, we're happy. Well, not quite. My wife doesn't really like it there, because she always wanted to live on the seaside. And she likes the, uh, the sea and, you know, the waves and the beach and all that stuff. And so we've been kind of struggling with this. And then we were like, hey, wait a minute. What we can do is we can just cut a piece of the house and move it on the beach, right? And that's where she lives now. And she's super happy about it, all right? I mean, she just opened the door and go on the beach, right? And it's, it's marvelous. And then I thought, wait a minute. My entire life, I was dreaming about living somewhere high in the mountains with this beautiful view. And I was like, if we can do this for my wife, why can't do this for me? So just get another piece of the house and move it on the top of the mountains, and this is where I live. And so it's amazing. Now everyone's super happy. Like the kids are happy, my wife's happy, I'm happy. It takes a little while to drive home for dinner, uh, right? But I mean, it's the price to pay. Did you buy that story? <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? And uh, I saw I, some of you started laughing the moment I first mentioned the cutting the house, right? But I'll tell you a story that most of you will believe. This is my monolithic system. It was working just fine. Everyone was super happy about it. But then we decided that this piece is going to be happier if it's deployed independently somewhere here. And then we decided that other piece is going to be much happier if we deploy it independently over there. And we split the system, and now everything works magically great as microservices. You buy that story? <laughs> much more believable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because that's what we expect. We expect to cut and slice and dice, distribute, and everything magically works right together. What we don't typically see is that there is a lot of interdependencies behind the scenes, between components, uh, between s so different software systems and whatnot, that it's going to cause us all kinds of problems that we need to solve. Out of curiosity, how many of you are familiar with the fallacies of distributed computing? That's what I thought, like, like uh, maybe five hands out of I don't know how many people we have in the room. So. One thing that always bothered me ever since I came up with that analogy, and that analogy came up as a part of a consulting um, exercise, and it, it, was ev it evolved over the years, but I one thing always bothers me about that is every time you tell the story, I tell the story about the house, people go immediately, <laughs> well, come on, right? <laughs> they, they, they see the nonsense immediately, right? But if I skip the, s the house story and just go for the system, if I were to tell them, let's just get your monolith and slice it, dice it, and deploy it on multiple servers, everyone's like, yeah, man, let's do that, uh, right? So why? Why we, in some cases, instantly see that something makes no sense, and in some cases, we don't see it until it's too late, 
and we are, you know, in a firefighting mode. And I think it comes to two terms. First of which is coherence. So you probably heard a lot of coherence over the years. I mean, it's a, it's a common thing that, that in software engineering we talk a lot about. And it's basically the property of, of being logical and, and, and uh, consistent. To me, you know, and it's always hard to explain. So I think the best way, the things that are hard to explain are best explained with an example. So let's imagine that you go and you will travel by a train. And then you go and enter the train and they tell you, yeah, that's the train that you enter, but your coat is going to travel with that other train. And your purse is going to travel with that other train. Yeah, imagine your reaction. Like, it's going to be the same thing with the house, right? It's like, no, like my belongings travel with me, period, right? And, and, and that's, it. that's the, the, what coherence is all about. There are some things that you don't want to split apart because they make sense together, right? But what a lot of people mean when they say coherence is they actually mean coupling. And coupling is different. If you think about it, w since we are with the trains example, if you think about the train cars, those are independent units, right? You, you, they're connected together, though. They're connected together for the sole purpose of you put an engine, one engine, in front of them, and it drags the whole thing. So there's an optimization purpose or performance reasons or whatnot that makes us couple things. But we can decouple them. We can grab those cars put an engine in front of every single one of those, right? And then they're going to serve the very same purpose. It's maybe less efficient, right? It may cause a different uh, other um, uh, things that we need to think about, but ultimately it will do the job. So here's a piece of advice. Every time you are in an argument situation where someone tries to tell you uh, that coherence and coupling are the same thing, you can always respond with coherence and coupling are the same, much like incoherence and decoupling are the same. And when you put it in the negative way, you can immediately see how that differs. So when I say to you, we're going to decouple those things, most of you will have this positive connotation. But when I say we're going to make things incoherent, it would be like, uh-oh, no, <laughs> right? So that's, but, but we only see it on the negative side. We don't see it on the positive side. But enough about coupling and, uh, and coherence. Let's talk about another term, connaissance. Any of you have heard of connaissance? One, two, three, yeah. That's the usual experience I have with this talk. Um, so the first time I heard the word connaissance was when I was reading this book, Fundamentals of Object-Oriented Design in UML. And Obviously, most people that have read that book focus on the UML part. And there's a pretty good chapter in that book about kinescence. So what is a kinescence? Kinescence is you have a kinescence when two or more things, for whatever reason, needs to leave or exist or, or, or to uh, uh, be tied to each other. And, and they, they have a common life cycle. They're born together. That they are somehow connected. So to give you an example, again with the trains, um, you can think of the wheels and the railroad. Now those are two separate things. They're most likely manufactured by different companies. Most likely different people make the decisions about um, uh, you know, what type of steel they use and what not. But there is a connaissance between them. You cannot manufacture either than the railroads or narrower for that matter, or in different shape, right? There is certain expectations that if one of those things changes, like if the shape of the railroad, uh, is you may think it's flat, but it's not, uh, if the shape changes, then the wheels also need to change. If the distance changes, the wheels also need to change, right? So those are independent things, technically, but they, they, there is a connaissance between them. If one changes, it implies a change on the other. And you will go like, oh, what, what that has to do with software? Well, here is a very complicated piece of code. 
I hope you can read it. Um, and uh, it's taken from an artificial system that deals with booking, uh, buying tickets for uh, visiting attractions and in a city. Like you visit Krakow and you can buy tickets to, you know, go to some places. And so it has, there is a connaissance in this code. Actually more than one, but let's you take, tackle the first one. Do you, do you recognize anything in that piece of code that you would say it, there is a connaissance? Probably not, because you didn't even know what connaissance is. So let me show it to you. It's what is known as connaissance of name. So you have this thing called attraction, main attraction. It, and uh, then you have a method which assigns a value to it. Now, if you were to change the name of that, uh, of that property or, or variable, you got to change it in both places. You cannot just change it in one. You have to, there is a connaissance between these two lines. That's the connaissance of name and it's boring. But there is another connaissance in that very same piece of code. And it's connaissance of type. That main attraction is of type attraction. If you wanted to change that type at any time, then you're going to have to go and figure out uh, uh, and change also the parameter of the ticket method or constructor or whatever that is. Uh, right? And there's a connaissance of type. And by now you should not be impressed. Uh, you should be rather like, oh, what the hell he's talking about? I mean, those are easy things to do, right? I'm just going to ask my IDE to, you know, go and do some refactoring and it's going to do it for me. And you would be right. And that's why we refer to those as low-level connaissance. Those are the, the types of connaissance that we most of the time have and we it relatively easily can deal with because we have the tools that can help us, right? Consider refactoring, for example. But let's go one idea more abstract. There is another connaissance. There's connaissance between these two pieces of code. Can you spot it? I uh, probably not, of course. So the the above is the um, the constructor uh, uh, for the ticket. Uh, and the one is the method that actually creates that ticket, right? And so there is a connaissance of algorithm or a connaissance of convention. In the constructor, we made the assumption, or we have the algorithm, that the first parameter is the main attraction, and the rest is all the optional other attractions that you buy tickets for. Now, we, whoever calls that needs to be aware that assumption slash algorithm. Because if you were to change the order in the list that you pass to that constructor, things will go terribly wrong. And if it's not a you know attraction booking system, but a, I don't know, something connected to nuclear power plant, you, you don't even, you know, you, you get the story, right? But you would say, well, that's easy to fix. Let's change the code. And let's make a dedicated, so we're just not going to grab a list and make assumptions about what are the things are in the list. We're going to have an explicit thing that says this is the main attraction, and then list of all the other attractions, and then we're going to call it uh, from some other place. Now you have a connaissance of position. Anytime you want to change the order, you're going to have to change it in multiple places, right? So there are lots of types of connaissances, and that's not the purpose of this presentation to go and explain all those to you. Uh, there, there's a wiki uh, page, I believe, where all there are listed with examples. So if you want to go and check them out, <coughs> you could. Uh, there is a, a, a connaissance of execution or timing when assumption is that s two things will happen at the very same time or in connections of execution that you have the assumption that one thing always happened before another thing, uh, right? Uh, uh, my favorite one is a connections of difference or uh, so-called contranescence because this is super hard initially to understand that there is a problem uh, with it, but it becomes apparent later on. And that basically relates to the fact that once you choose something, let's say a name, you can't choose it again for different purpose. Let's say you created a property 
that it's called name or it's called price. You, you reserve the word name or price for something and you're good with that. Six months down the road, you came to the conclusion that actually that word may be better suited for another data structure and you can't use it anymore because you already took it some time ago and then you're going to have to go and do all the changes to replace that word with something else so you can use that word because now it makes more sense in different contexts. Right? So that's, that's a tricky one, but when you refactor large systems, it's one that bites you the most. And so we talk about con connaissance, we talk about coherence and coupling, and are those related? And, and, and sometimes we just wonder, like, okay, all these connaissances, like, are they caused by coherence or coupling? Like, can we decouple, can we break them uh, and whatnot? And the answer is sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And so if we, if we have to live with this, how do we design systems that can change and that can evolve? Without being put in this situation where every time we're facing a change, it's like, oh my God, there's like three million classes that I need to go fix. Well, let's make, uh, how many of you have read this book? Main driven, yeah, quite a few people. That's good. So in domain-driven design, Eric Evans talks about something called the aggregate. And it's probably the most overused and abused term in domain-driven design. Uh, but it, it basically says it's a group of objects that we treat as a one thing, as a whole, with respect to changes. So and then this is not a proper example of DDD, but just so to illustrate the idea, you can, uh, you can think of, a, for example, of a car. Like a car consists of multiple things. It has the wheel, it has the tires, it has the seats, it has like... But from your user perspective, it's a car, right? You don't think of it as a, uh, as a, a collection of wheels and, uh, and seats and uh, steering wheel, right? Y you give it a name and you operate with that object as a whole. And so that's essentially the idea of aggregate, even though that example is like pure DDD purist will be all over me for using that as an example, but just to, to so you visualize it. But when you, when you compare aggregate, the definition of aggregate with, with coherence, you can see a lot of common things in there. Like we're talking about a group of associated objects, we treat them as a whole, uh, they're logical and consistent, uh, there's boundaries around them and whatnot. And so what we can do then is we can treat things like aggregates. We can put boundaries around groups of objects and say, hmm, inside those things are very coherent. They may be coupled, may not be coupled, doesn't matter, but they, they're, very, they're very coherent inside. So what we can afford to have is higher connaissance. Because chances are, if we are going to make changes inside, it's going to touch as many of those uh, components that, that create the aggregate. Right? Anyway, and we need to understand it as a whole anyway. Right? And so it's totally okay to have a higher connaissance within those boundaries. But, and then you can have another aggregate or another aggregate-like structure that also internally has a higher connaissance. What you want in order to, for your system to evolve less painful is to have lower connaissance between those components. So everything that is, uses, is used to communicate between those groups of objects, you should only have lo uh, uh, lower connaissance, meaning connaissance of name and type. And that's how we typically design systems, like we had a piece of data that goes between components. Uh, sometimes we call it event. Uh, and, um, uh, and it passes by. Now, my favorite part of this diagram, and in, in any diagram, uh, is arrows. Right? That's, that's for a like couple of decades already doing software design. I, I see people do that. I've done it myself many times. That you draw a box or a cylinder or whatever. It, that's my system A. 
and then you draw another box or cylinder or whatever, that's my system B, and you draw an arrow, and that's it, done. I'm like, huh, okay, tell me about implementing the arrow, right? Because that's, that's kind of the, 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 the trickiest thing. In our, we just, you draw an arrow, and it kind of assumes that it solves the problem, right? But the trickiest thing to implement from a diagram is the arrow. Right, how do these two actually communicate? Like what data structures they exchange? What happens if there is a change? Uh, what protocols are there? And what, all that stuff, no, arrow, gone. Right, so let's focus on the errors. Like what happens in here? Do we have something that I would call a connaissance of location? In other words, how, do, how does this component know how to send information to that component and vice versa. So initially that is kind of like, uh, what, what are you talking about? So let's go through some more examples. Uh, here is the same uh, extraction of the same artificial system. So you have a handle request that receives some request from somewhere to buy a ticket, and it calls buy ticket method to buy a ticket. Now. You see any problem with this code? Of course not. It's perfectly fine. Except it operates under the assumption that both are in the same class. If you grab one of those and move it in a different Java class, that code no longer works. And you go like, oh, come on. Like We know how to deal with stuff like that. We're just going to introduce a service, right? Uh, we have our method in there, and then we're just going to call whatever the ticket service is, uh, and blah, blah, blah. That works. That works perfectly fine. But it operates under the assumption that both classes are in the same package. And then you go like, okay, you never heard of imports? I'm like, yeah, I have. So you can just import that. And that's okay. So the problem, well, not quite. Now you operate under the assumptions that both are on the same class path or module path, depends on whatever you version of Java you use, uh, right? So there's an assumption there. Uh, if you want to put this in a different VM, so that's no longer working. So people go, okay, we'll write this, right? Anyone gets what that is? REST, baby. All right, so you're going to have a RESTful service, and we're going to call that RESTful service from my other service, and there is no any connaissance uh, stuff, right? Well, as connaissance of configuration at minimum, right, because you still need to tell where that service is, how to talk to that service, right? And then you need to configure that service. Should you ever choose to move this to some other place, then you have a problem. And yes, I'm aware DNS exists and about a million other uh, ways to solve that problem. That's not that the problem is not solvable. The problem, the, 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 the one I'm trying to say is you shouldn't have that problem in the first place, uh, right? Because then it, if you have that problem, you come up with another layers of abstractions and infra that you have to maintain to solve that very problem. And it would be much easier if you didn't have that problem in the first place. And so you most of the time go where everyone goes these days. Uh, yeah, and uh, on top of that, by the way, there is also connections of uh, a name. But yeah, that's, let's ignore that. So then everyone goes in their favorite way. Kafka. Right? We can just put Kafka in the middle, and Kafka solves all the problems, right? Um, and so we're just going to send messages through Kafka, and well, that's pretty much the same thing. You still have to deal with those, those topics or queues or whatever you're, you know, it doesn't have to be Kafka. It can be RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, whatever messaging system you have in place. Uh, right, but you still have to deal with those locations. You still have to know how to route a, a message from one place to another, uh, and what to subscribe for, and uh, and whatnot. And it's not related to your business logic. It's related to a technical term, a queue, uh, a topic, 
or something. That's not part of your business domain. It's a technical constraint that you use. So that the same thing like class path or package, right? I, I, it's a technical constraint that you, you use to ensure things work, but it's not part of your domain, business domain. So what I argue is that basically those are different ways of doing communication that, is, uh, that, that, that shows us there is a location awareness. The components in one form or shape are, need to be aware of the location of other components. It may be explicit, it may be implicit, but they need to know somehow who they are talking to and where that other thing is and if there is something there at all, right? And so can we solve that problem then? So we want to have only connections of name and type in the middle in that, in that communication. We want to avoid the connections of, of location. So let's take a step back. Forget about all the tools that we already know, all the Kafkas and message buses and Kubernetes and everything that you've been so eagerly learn, learning about all these time. Take a step back and think about it. What's that thing in the middle? It's, we call it a piece of data. A lot of people will call it event. We can just call it a message. Uh, right, so there's, there's some message that needs to go from point A to point B. Now, if you call it event, you're kind of limiting yourself to a specific subtypes of messages, right? But when you call it a message, you can start reasoning about what kind of messages are there, right? And there are at least three types of messages that, that differ in how they are routed, how they are delivered, if there is a response, and whatnot. And those are commands, events, and queries. And the main, the, the distinction is intent. What you intend to do, or your system intends to do, by sending a message to another system. So commands are basically requests for performing an operation. You're asking another system, another component, to do something. And as such, you are not asking everyone. You're asking a particular component that knows how to execute that command, uh, right? And in terms of response, the only thing that you most likely what you only the only thing that you want back is acknowledgement or or a lack of it. So you you want to know whether that component will actually do what you're asking for or not, right? Now, when you send an event message, you basically notify the world that something has happened. Like, hey, ticket was issued, right? You know, a product was added to the shopping cart. So you tell the world something happened, right? And then you need to tell everyone who is interested in that particular event, and you don't expect any response. Right? You, your job is to tell them it happened, they do whatever they want with it, so there's no communication back. Now, when you send the query type of message, you basically request an, it's basically a request for information. So you're asking another component to provide you with some, some information, one or more components, right? And guess what? As for the, the previous ones, we rarely care about any response. In here, everything you care about is response, right? Because if you ask for information and you don't get it, there's no point in that. Right? And so those are the how these different types of messages differ. In commands, you have usually a single recipient, a single message handler that, that the message goes to. With event, it goes to pretty much all the components that are registered for uh, handling this type, of, interested in, handli in handling these types of events. And for queries, it can go to one or multiple component because it can be tell me the, what you know or you five tell me what you know and merge it together and give me a combined result, uh, right? The other way they differ is the, the, the response type, whether we need a confirmation only, whether we have, where we expect no results at all, 
or where we expect merged results from multiple components or, you know, in, single, uh, in, in other cases, a single response. So when we think about messaging this way, can we implement that? Can we build a system that behaves this way? Let's give it a try. So imagine, we call, well, first thing we need to model those, those uh, message types. And we'll model them as Java classes, plain POJOs, plain you know, Java objects. So that over there is uh, issue ticket command. It basically says, um, I want you to issue a new ticket. And it tells you for what it is for the main attraction and for the list of attractions. And by the way, this slide predates Java, whichever version of records uh, um, showed up. Uh, which, uh, so it, this could be also Java records, um, right? But yeah, you get the idea. It's POJO's records, same thing. Um, and then you have an event, which is also a class or a record that basically says, well, that's the idea of the ticket. Uh, that's the, the main attraction it applies to. That was the list of other attractions, blah, blah, blah. Then you have two classes, which are records, which are the query and the query response. So basically, the query is like, here is the ticket ID. Tell me what um, attractions I can attend with, uh, go to with that ticket. And the response is, well, here is with that ticket, you can go the main attraction and the list of other attractions. It's super simple, plain old Java stuff, right? And so we have those. So now we need to pass them somehow. Well, for that, we're going to need some sort of a message router. Right, something that knows how to serialize, deserialize those things and move them from one place to another. Skip that part for now. And then we have the producers. We have these components that can create commands, queries, and events and send them through that message router somewhere. So how can we do that with Java? What would be an interesting way of doing that? Well, let's assume we have these magic things like gateways, let's call them gateways. And there's a command gateway, an event gateway, and a query gateway. And then you can construct an object, which is the POJO that you just saw on the previous slide, and then get the command gateway and say, send and wait, which is a synchronous way of sending a message. We can just say send and give it a timeout and it will be asynchronous, for example. And the same thing with the event. You can just grab the event gateway, say, here's my event, tell the world. Whoever is interested in that event, let them know. And similarly, you can have something that's called query gateway and say, here is my query, which is, again, plain old Java object. And I expect a response that is a single instance of an object, of a response type, or a list of um, uh, uh, responses, right? Simple, right? So, and this sends some stuff somewhere to this magic message router in the middle. Now, what's on the flip side, right? So how does this message router knows where that, that those messages need to go to, right? Well, it knows because there are some other components, which we call consumers, that may register with the message router and they don't care about topics and queues and any infrastructural information. All they care about is to tell the router what types of messages they can process. And they can do this the, the way we always do things in Java with annotations, uh, right? Who doesn't like annotations? Yeah, scholar guys. <laughs> um, so. Let's imagine you have some classes that have methods, and there's a method that basically says on issue ticket command. So that's the type of command that I understand, and I know what to do with this command. And it says I'm a command handler. So if a command comes in of this type, I can handle it. And there is an event handler that says if ticket issue event comes in, I can handle it. I know what to do with this. All right? I'm interested in that notification. Uh, and there's a query handler that says, yeah, if ticket attraction query comes in, I can handle it, and I'll return a ticket attraction response, whatever. Super easy, right? And then it's your logic in there, like whatever that thing needs to do, right? And so that's pretty much the entire system. 
that is location transparent. You have this magical message router. You have producers that produce different types of messages. And you give consumers that can consume different types of messages. And no component needs to know, needs to be aware of where, whether, where other components are located. Too beautiful to be true. Crazy. Okay. So how do we, can we make this actually happen? Well, we can. We can build a framework. Hey, who doesn't like frameworks? Um, we can build a framework that actually does this for us. And the only thing that this framework needs to do is it needs to provide you with those gateways, so you can or um, buses or whatever you want to call them, uh, right? So you can send those messages, and it's to provide you with a way for the consumers to subscribe for different types of messages, right? And it has to be able to do some routing, like from here to there, based on the information provided. It's not that hard, actually, to build a framework like this. But what it gives you is that you can now have a hard connaissance and so all sorts of dependencies and things within your components. They can be coherent, they can be aggregate, they can be something else. But because they are encapsulated, they have their own boundary, all the stuff that you do within them doesn't affect any other component. So whenever you have to mix things up and uh, do uh, like ch millions of changes that are uh, react, uh, uh, interconnected with other components within the scope of that boundaries, you're good. No other components are uh, affected because every communication with other components is through messages. And now when I when I say messages, I don't have—I don't actually mean that you have to uh, 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 do this distributed immediately. It could be in the same JVM. It could be a messaging within the JVM, highly efficient, uh, without serialization and deserialization, but a one that allows you to keep the higher connaissance in the component, keep the lo the connaissance of name and type only in the communication. And the company I work for built such framework, and they call it Axon Framework. So if you want to give it a try, it's free, uh, open source, Java framework. Um, yeah, uh, you can try it. Now, what that helps you do is you can actually build a single monolithic application that, that works that way. The communication between those components uh, is location transparent. And that all works in a single deployment in one JVM. And then you would be like, OK, but what if, what if I want to grab that piece and move it and deploy it somewhere else? Right? So now you need a framework in the middle that can cross server boundaries. It can go over the network. Right? So there's different ways to doing this. As I said, it's an open source framework, so you could do things like JGroups and a bunch of other Java protocols that allows you to do networking. And then you're in the burden of doing networking stuff, which you probably don't want to do. So you can also use things that, uh, that we call Axon Server. And Axon Server is another, uh, well, it's not strictly open source, but it's, uh, the, uh, it has two editions, like the community, the standard edition and the enterprise one, and the standard edition is free to use. Um, so that is essentially a distributed router. You can think of it as kind of a Kafka, but, with, uh, but one that understands message types. All right. and it makes a difference between commands, queries, and events, and knows how to route them. Uh, right. And it also is an event store, but that's a different topic. And Axonic Cloud is basically the uh, version of Axon Server in a cloud that we manage for you. Uh, and so basically when you want to go distribute it, you just put that thing in the middle and you say, now my routing will go through that. And your code does not change at all. You don't have to go and configure queues or topics or make sure that classes are on the same class path or none of this, right? You can just grab a component and put it on different machine 
and uh, for as long as all are connected to the uh, to the server, routing is becomes distributed, right? And that only works in Java, of course, or any JVM language, as a matter of fact. For some reason, some people recently tend to use Kotlin a lot. Uh, but if you want to break out JVM land, then you can't really do it with that. Then you need another component, which we call trickily Axon Synapse. And Axon Synapse, because all this communication in, in, uh, in the distributed environment happens through gRPC. And so if you don't feel like dealing with gRPC, gRPC is too low level for you, um, uh, you just use the server. But when you break out the JVM, then you have to deal with gRPC, uh, right, if you want to talk to the server. And so sign what Synapse does is basically uh, translates between HTTP and gRPC. So you can talk to the entire system through HTTP requests. Right, and you can send an HTTP request that's a command query or event and receive and be notified or be connect contacted from the server via HTTP uh, if you want to handle command query or event. And then you can anything that speaks HTTP can actually participate. So you can have a system that a Java component sends a command to, uh, I don't know, a process in Rust somewhere uh, which sends a query that's handled by JavaScript and whatnot. Like, it's, it's, yeah, anything that speaks HTTP can get in the picture. So, because my employer is sending me to give this talk, I have to give you the, give them the courtesy of explaining all the products for you, so please uh, visit, try it out. And as I said, all those are free. Uh, so, an open source, some of them are open source. Uh, so, do, uh, um, do explore, let me know what you think. Uh, and if you don't really care about our products, it's totally fine. Think about the concept. Because it's not, I'm not here to sell you anything, but I hope you're going to start thinking about how we're doing communication these days, and if there are better ways to do it, other than just snap Kafka or whatever any message thing you're using. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe there are other products that I don't know of. Let me know. The challenge is take a step back, think about the problem, think what we want to solve, think how we solve it, how you would solve it, and uh, in, instead of just fall in the, for this, that's this product. For this, there's that product, right? That's why I spent the bigger part of that talking about the concept and, uh, and another product. So. Thank you very much. That was pretty much everything I wanted to say. And for some reason, my presentation doesn't go to the thank you slide. It goes now. Um, so if you want to get in contact with me, uh, those are my social media things. Um, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>